Good morning, everyone. We're happy to welcome you to day two of SPG's Pulse Agronomy Workshop. My name is Alison Fletcher, and I am the Research Project Manager with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and I'll be your host for today's workshop. This is the third time SPG has offered the Pulse Agronomy Workshop, and we are really glad to have you join us today. So for those of you who are in attendance today, if you provided either a CCA or CCSC number at the time of your registration, you will receive credits for today's sessions. After the workshop concludes, a recording will be available online. So be sure to watch for an email from SPG on how to access those recordings following today's session. At the end of the presentations, there will be a live question and answer discussion. So if you have questions, please type them into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel so we can address them at the time. There are also handouts and resources relevant to today's session that you can access right through the GoToWebinar on your dashboard. SPG is guided by the grower elected board of directors driven to create opportunities for profitable growth for Saskatchewan pulses. Two of SPG's five key result areas relate to research, development and extension with the purpose of increasing yields of established pulse crops and promoting the adoption of new pulse crop options. This year's Pulse Agronomy Workshop focuses on two topics that support both of these key result areas. Yesterday, we covered root rot diseases and today targets integrated pest management and fertility in pulses. We recognize the value that agronomists bring to the growers in Saskatchewan, as you are key in spreading the technical knowledge and widening the reach of this information to growers. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. For our first session comes from Hugh Becky, Australian Herbicide Resistance Initiative Director and Professor at University of Western Australia. He was going to walk us through herbicide resistance and the international experience. Hugh grew up on a farm near Davidson, Saskatchewan and farmed for over 30 years. He began his 26 year career as a weed scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in 1992. Hugh was also an adjunct professor in the Department of Agricultural, Food and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. His research program focused on surveillance, risk assessment and management of herbicide resistance weeds, as well as impact assessment of novel trait or GM crops. Hugh has served as the president of the Canadian Weed Science Society and became a fellow of the society in 2017. In 2018, he received the fellow award from the Weed Science Society of America. Since July of 2018, he is the director of the Australian Herbicide Resistance Initiative and professor of crop weed science at the University of Western Australia. Because Hugh lives in Australia, his session has been pre-recorded and he will not be available for the Q&A today. We will, however, forward any questions for Hugh, so please do post them in the questions box and we will follow up with his answers following today's session. It's a pleasure to uh, present once again to the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for this invitation to talk to you about pulse crops and herbicide resistant weed management in Australia. So in Australia, there are 1.5 million hectares of pulse crops grown. Lupins are grown primarily in Western Australia, 0.8 million hectares, followed by lentils, 0.4 million hectares, mainly in South Australia. Chickpeas, 0.3 million hectares, mainly in New South Wales on the eastern side of the country, followed by faba beans or beans and field peas at about 0.2 million hectares each. So this slide from Ian Heap's website shows the increase in the number of herbicide resistant weed biotypes in the various countries. So of course, the United States, number one, followed by Australia, number two, and then Canada, number three. The top economic weeds here in Western Australia would be annual ryegrass, wild radish, wild oats, brome grass, and barnyard grass. So four of the top weeds, top five weeds are grass weeds. And of course, the greatest concern to weed scientists is the increasing number of weed populations resistant to more than one herbicide site of action or herbicide group. And the weeds that are highlighted in red are the ones, uh, important weeds in Australia. So annual ryegrass, uh, up to populations, up to 14 different uh, resistant to up to 14 different sites of action, barnyard grass, wild oats, similar to Western Canada, and then jungle rice and the two fleabane species. So my colleague Roberto Bussi here in, at ARI conducted a annual ryegrass resistance survey of 579 populations across the country. And you can see there's quite a variation in resistance profile by state. So in Western Australia, uh, clethodim resistance was the highest. And this is an important group one herbicide that is still 
uh, used uh, fairly frequently uh, to control various grass weeds. In South Australia, uh, we have populations, a number of populations with especially pyroxosulfone and trifluralin resistance. So pyroxosulfone group 15, relatively new herbicide, and then trifluralin, uh, as you know, a relatively old herbicide. In New South Wales, uh, we have very high levels of resistance to glyphosate, and certainly the cropping systems uh, in this part of the country are quite different than, say, Western Australia, and consequently the glyphosate use patterns are different. And then in Victoria, a uh, very similar situation as to South Australia in terms of relatively high levels, high frequency resistance to pyroxosulfone and trifluralin. So here we have population of ryegrass in 2017 that uh, was found to be resistant to group one herbicides, group two herbicides, and glyphosate, as well as all registered pre-emergence herbicides used uh, for annual ryegrass control at the time. So these include group three and group 15. Fortunately, uh, the triazines group five and paraquat group 22 are still effective. Note previously, just a year or two ago, that triolate, prosulfocarb, EPTC, and thiobencarb were all classified as group 8 herbicides. They have now been moved into group 15, similar to pyroxysulfone. And so this is certainly a wake-up call that, um, you know, we can get annual ryegrass populations that uh, are resistant to most of the pre-emergence herbicides used for its control. So in Australia, we have the Weed Smart, which is an industry-sponsored organization which promotes herbicide stewardship and integrated weed management. And the so-called big six are shown here. Uh, the, the pillar, of course, is a crop rotation diversity, so rotating crops, annual crops, and also pastures where growers uh, include livestock in their cropping systems. And they recommend, for example, double break crops, and this is basically two non-cereal crops between mainly uh, wheat and barley, which are uh, commonly grown here in Western Australia. In terms of crop competition, uh, the four elements that are promoted are high seeding rate, narrow row spacing, and growers have seeding equipment where you can uh, quite easily adjust the row spacing uh, down to six inches, although probably eight inches would be more common. Seeding east-west, uh, given the latitude that we are here in Australia, uh, by seeding east-west, there's more shading in the inter-row versus north-south, and therefore more weed suppression. And then growing a competitive cultivar, although those are not readily identified in extension bulletins. Just as an aside, showing here is a stripper header, so they're looking at the strip and disc system, whereas where they seed using a disc seeder into high residue standing stubble left by the stripper header, and the and they're finding that the weed suppression benefits and the crop potential benefits are are generally positive, but there certainly needs to be much more research on that here. And this is something that I know was investigated in Western Canada many years ago. In terms of crop competition, RE has a number of trials uh, going on this past year and previous years. So Mike Ashworth is the lead agronomist here in RE. So this trial uh, has three factors. One is, the first factor is the type of pre-emergence herbicide. So we have trifluralin group three, boxer gold group 15, as well as pyroxosulfone group 15. Two new herbicides uh, that have been introduced in the last two years, uh, Luximax, active ingredient synethylin, which is group 30, and Overwatch, active ingredient bixlazone, which is group 13. And so these are new modes of action for annual ryegrass control, which is the main weed um, examined in this study. And then Bayer plans to introduce Matino Complete next year, which is a three-way uh, mode of action mixture for annual ryegrass and other weed control in cereal crops. Second factor, crop density. So looking at um, the average, which is about 150, and then lower and higher than that. And then time of sowing. Uh, traditionally, growers waited for the rain uh, before they seeded, but now because of large farm size and greater yield potential, they seed uh, early, usually late April, 
and it's usually dry. And so he's looking at both early dry seeding and the regional average. What Mike's found basically is that depending on the residual herbicide, uh, there's different levels of activity. For example, the activity of trifluralin and boxer gold that run out quicker have lower residual activity than other herbicides like Overwatch and Retino. And so when seeding dry or early, they recommend using a longer soil residual product and increasing the seeding rate for greater weed competitiveness. And if you have dirty fields, uh, we do recommend uh, delay seeding using the double knock, which I'll mention in a minute, and of course, uh, the big six. Canola is another important crop, the most important broadleaf crop here in Western Australia. And so Mike is looking at five different factors. One is seed size, seeding rate, hybrid versus OP. Uh, just an, as a, an aside, uh, most of the canola varieties grown in Australia are open pollinated, uh, triazine tolerant, and so growers can use bin run seed. And so seeding cost is less of an issue than, for example, hybrid seed, row spacing, and then herbicide versus untreated. And Mike's results have found that uh, you, know, you need a, a target plant density of greater than 35 plants per square meter, and certainly uh, uh, greater seed size helps promote canola seedling vigor and competitiveness, again, against annual ryegrass, which was a target weed in this trial. So double knock is um, quite unique to Australia. And again, if, if you have a flush of weeds uh, during the burn down phase preceding, Double knock is when you apply glyphosate, followed 10 to 14 days later by Paraquat. And um, Paraquat does is it mops up any survivors from the glyphosate, and therefore it helps preserve uh, glyphosate from, uh, gly uh, from uh, greater uh, incidence of glyphosate resistance. So these are just the various crops. The ones in red are the ones in Australia, uh, the various traits in these crops. And of course, some crops like soybean uh, have both single and stack traits. Lentil, for example, clearfield is grown here as well. Clearfield barley is only grown in Australia. Wheat, we have group one and group two tolerant uh, varieties. And then of course, uh, the other crops as well. So if we look at, for example, red lentil in Australia, uh, this is the acreage in terms in 2020, and it's mainly red lentil uh, we're talking about. And of course, similar to Western Canada, there's been rapid adoption of uh, ME resistant lentil because of weed control. And also genotypes with good uh, metribuzin tolerance, Sencor, have been developed and introduced. Uh, spray topping uh, pre-harvest, and I'll mention this in a minute, with Paraquat is a common practice. And so this, the idea is to apply this when annual ryegrass is in the flowering stage to suppress a weed seed set. So the impact on integrated weed management, um, um, there is a lot of group one and group two resistance in annual ryegrass. And so this, will, uh, this won't be the group two use in Lentil will not control ryegrass, but uh, it certainly um, will control uh, other other important weeds that have not developed group two resistance. Um, it is the weakest link in terms of weed control, and so um, carefully planning which fields you're going to seed uh, pulse crops is important uh, here in Australia. So this slide basically shows the uh, wish list or the, some of the activities in terms of herbicide resistant pulse crop development here in Australia. And um, certainly um, there's a lot of talk about the promise of gene editing um, versus conventional breeding or chemical mutagenesis as non-GM techniques to, to develop uh, varieties with uh, herbicide tolerance traits and perhaps even um, focusing on weed competitiveness traits in the medium to long term. For example, in Canada, um, I know that uh, Eric Johnson and others have thought about group 27 resistance traits, so the HPPD inhibitors, if non-GM. Typically, HPPD inhibitors are additive or synergistic with group 5 herbicides, and so that would be, that would be a bonus. Uh, 
uh, group 5 tolerance in field P, for example, metribuzin and ventazon, or metribuzin and lentil, and as I mentioned before, we have enhanced tolerance lines in Australia. Pyridate group 6 is registered in Australia in chickpea. And so with soil applied uh, pre-emergence PPO inhibitors, group 14, plus group 15, which are very long chain fatty acid inhibitors like pyroxysulfone, uh, that can be used will possibly have systems in our pulse crops with four unique modes of action. And so this is certainly uh, a better situation than 20 or 30 years ago, but certainly uh, more efforts are needed in, in this regard. And so here in Australia, uh, we have developed uh, group two um, tolerance varieties, uh, lentil, for example, faba bean. Uh, again, metribuzin tolerant varieties are being developed and have been developed for these particular pulse crops. We're looking at uh, diflufenic intolerance in lentil and chickpea, which is group 12. And again, the HPBD inhibitor resistance, uh, isoxoflutol. Uh, group 5, uh, tolerance in these pulse crops, uh, clopyridate tolerant chickpea, uh, the mung beans, and then in lupins, um, various herbicides are being looked at in terms of potential herbicide tolerance traits. Of course, however, a lot of the breeding efforts now are still focused on disease resistance. And so this shot just shows in the bottom a, a variety of chickpea with enhanced uh, clopyrrolid or group 4 tolerance. So my colleague Roberto Bussi has look, looked a lot at mixtures and their efficacy in controlling resistant populations. And so um, he collected 140 annual ryegrass populations looking at if you look at the right side, the survival after treatment with standalone products and then mixtures. And basically you found that even if a population was resistant to say trifluralin and prosulfocarb, by using that mixture, you could achieve greater efficacy, greater control than by using the herbicide separately. So um, you can see in some cases, for example, pyroxysulfone plus triolate, uh, controlled all of the uh, populations, uh, some of whom were resistant. And so this is something that growers are increasingly adopting, uh, particularly pre-emergence herbicide mixtures, um, whether it be trifluralin plus uh, triolate or with another herbicide. And I mentioned previously um, annual ryegrass weed seed set or, or other weeds through um, pre-harvest application of paraquat in pulse crops. There is some crop injury, but uh, this, is, um, this is assumed by some of the growers um, when they, just because the advantages of, of weed seed set outweigh the, the disadvantages in terms of, of crop yield injury. So harvest weed seed control is termed the holy grail of the big six. And this slide just shows the, the six main uh, techniques. So on the upper left, we have a mechanical mill, in this case, uh, a vertical Harrington seed destructor on the upper left, a horizontal unit next to it on the right side. We have chaff tram lining on the upper right where the chaff is laid down behind the tire tracks, which is a more hostile environment. So a lot of the weed seeds are in the chaff fraction. On the bottom left, we have chaff lining, uh, where the chaff is in a single narrow row behind the combine. We have chaff wagons, of course, originally developed in Canada, or chaff carts, and then the bale direct system on the upper right. And what's not shown here is uh, narrow windrow burning, which we're trying to get away from. And so there's been a uh, very high adoption of harvest weed seed control, particularly for annual ryegrass control. And research have basically found that it reduces annual ryegrass recruitment the following season by an average of 60%. So again, this is for weeds that don't readily shatter at, at or near harvest time. And certainly annual ryegrass and wild radish are two weeds that do not readily shatter, which is fortunate. And this chart uh, found on an RE Insight uh, newsletter on the RE website just lists some of the uh, pros and cons of, of the various systems and um, what each system is, is best suited for.
So there's been more and more uh, research into site-specific or precision wheat management. And here in Western Australia, we have very hot, dry summers from December to March. And so there are times, depending on the rain events, when you have to control weeds. And so these optical sprayers, whether it be a weed it or a weed seeker, are becoming commonplace because you can have herbicide savings uh, between 80 and 90 percent. So it can quickly pay for itself after a few growing seasons. And on the bottom right, um, we have recent, recently developed weed chippers. So again, it's an optical uh, unit, have cameras, which um, with the tines hydraulically controlled, so they can chip the weeds out only where they occur. So this is what we call uh, green on brown weed control. But we're also looking at green on green uh, weed control or real-time weed control uh, in cereal crops. And so the company called Buildberry is using AI-based algorithms. And basically they found 90% broadleaf weed control in cereal crops, such as wheat, with travel speeds of 20 kilometers an hour. And they note that escapes are mainly uh, those due to shading by the crop, which of course uh, is aggravated as the as the crop development or the crop matures with canopy closure. Holy grail, of course, would be grass weed control, such as on your, on your rye grass and cereal crops, uh, and, but we do have quite a ways to achieve that goal. And here we have a unit used by Gold Acres, a sprayer that uses Billberry's spot spraying program and towed by an autonomous uh, vehicle. Here in Ari, we have a PhD student which has been looking at LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. So this is a unit which is mounted on the combine, sends out a beam of light used to both detect and map weeds later in the growing season that grow above the crop canopy, such as wild oat. And um, she has found that uh, it is quite accurate and effective in detecting weeds like wild oat uh, shown in the bottom center, or wild radish, bottom left, or even broom grass uh, above a wheat crop. Although not investigating pulse crops because pulse crops are shorter stature uh, generally than cereal crops, I think there's a lot of potential for this technology to be used in pulse crops, whether it be lentils or field peas. And these are just two of the papers that she has published, and there's a third paper uh, again, which sort of describes the system and some of the um, limitations and potential advantages. So in summary, herbicide-resistant weed management uh, in Australia centers on three main areas. First of all, crop competition, and so um, competitive cultivars and, and just good agronomic practices to boost crop competition, uh, while also ideally including pulses in that rotation. Uh, a robust herbicide package, and as I mentioned, they rely a lot on pre-emergent soil residual herbicides. And finally, harvest weed seed control uh, is integral to sustainable weed management. There are many challenges to growing pulses in Australia. Is still, I would, I would characterize as an industry which uh, has a lot of potential uh, in terms of relative profitability versus other crops. There are significant soil constraints here in Australia, whether it be soil acidity, non-wetting soils, low organic matter soils, um, and of course, uh, weed challenges and disease challenges. And certainly, uh, as in Western Canada and elsewhere, uh, we do need new non-GM herbicide tolerance traits to improve uh, post-emergence weed control yields and, and to grow the pulse crop industry uh, globally. With that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention, and hopefully through some mechanism, I'll be able to answer any questions that you may have. Oh, sorry about that. Thanks. Uh, our thanks to Hugh for that presentation, for uh, sending that and, and uh, recording that for us so we can enjoy that this morning. A reminder that if you have any questions for any of today's presenters, please type them into the questions box and we'll address them in the panel discussion at the end of the workshop. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Charles Geddes from Weed Ecology and Cropping Systems at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Charles is going to share an update on the herbicide-resistant weeds and surveys and the Kosha termination project. Dr. Geddes is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada based out of Lethbridge, Alberta, 
where he leads the weed ecology and cropping systems research program and focuses on discovery, monitoring and management of herbicide resistant weeds in Western Canada. Charles grew up on a mixed cattle forage grain farm near Pilot Mound, Manitoba and graduated with a BSc in agroecology and a PhD in plant science with specialization in weed science from the University of Manitoba. Currently, he leads a prairie-wide research project, including the Prairie Herbicide Resistant Weed Surveys and several projects based on integrated weed management. Welcome, Dr. Geddes. Thanks very much. Um, can you please confirm that you can see my screen? Everything yep. looks great. Thanks, Dr. Geddes. Thank you very much. Okay, so so thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be giving a bit of an update on herbicide resistant weed research in, in the prairie region. And uh, I, I broke today's presentation up into two sections. So the, the first is, is covering an update on the Saskatchewan herbicide resistant weed survey. And then the second is looking at uh, more specifically at management of herbicide resistant kochia. So just to jump right into it, because we have limited time today, um, what one of the, the projects that I have the pleasure of leading is the Prairie Herbicide Resistant Weed Surveys. And, and, and these surveys were initially designed and led by Hugh Becky, who we, who we just heard from. Um, so following his retirement, I, I sort of took over management of these surveys. And these surveys are um, one of the, the tools that we use to, to document the status of herbicide resistance in the Prairie region. Um, the surveys cover about 800 fields across the prairies over the course of four years. So the last round of surveys was between 2014 and 2017. And what we do in these surveys is, is we uh, visit the fields just before harvest and we collect viable seed from any of the residual weed populations present in the field. And we bring those populations back to our research center where they enter our herbicide resistance diagnostics pipeline and we um, can determine the status of herbicide resistance across the prairies. So, so we combine this with also mapping um, the populations within each field and also a grower management questionnaire, which asks, asks questions about, uh, about ma management of that specific field, but then also questions about the perceived impact and cost of herbicide resistance um, by growers. And so we can kind of, we can aggregate the, the data on, at multiple levels. And, and so here just showing one of the um, main metrics that, that comes from the survey, which is the percentage of fields um, that are infested with at least one herbicide resistant weed biotype. And you can see for the three prairie provinces that this has been increasing um, over time since the early 2000s. Uh, the last round of surveys showed 57% of fields in Saskatchewan um, were infested with at least one herbicide resistant weed. So I mentioned um, combining this with the grower uh, management questionnaire, we can also look at um, the area of infestation and the cost of resistance. So across the prairies, this previous round of surveys showed that herbicide resistant weeds infest about 24 million acres um, and cost farmers $530 million annually. And this is this is a cost that that is um, that is received directly by farmers. So one of the projects that I'm leading is, is the next round of survey or the fourth round of herbicide resistant weed surveys across the prairies. And we started off with Saskatchewan in 2019 and 2020, uh, where we surveyed 419 fields in the province over two years. And uh, this survey, it's a, what we call a randomized stratified survey. So the sites are randomly selected. Um, and it's stratified based on cultivated area within each eco district and also generally covers the um, the acreage that we would see for various crops in the province as well. Um, so you can see a large number of the fields were canola, followed by uh, wheat and durum, um, then lentil, barley, oats, field pea, flax, and even uh, a few intercrops in there as well. Um, so I'll, I'll be showing some of the preliminary data from this. So, so one thing to note is that these data are preliminary and they may be subject to change um, because we're not yet complete um, diagnostics for all of the weed species. So to start off with one of the um, most impactful uh, herbicide resistant weed biotypes in Saskatchewan, uh, group one resistance in, in wild oat, you can see here um, spread uh, pretty evenly across the province. And 
we, we saw a steady increase in group one resistance in, in wild oats in Saskatchewan here shown in red, um, where we saw an increase from 59% in 2014 and 15 to now 76% of fields where wild oat is, is collected post-harvest and, and tested. Now, group two resistance actually showed a bit of a different story here, and I'm, I'm still sort of working on a few hypotheses to try and figure out why we're seeing this, but it is, um, we did see a bit of a stagnation in, in group two resistance in, in wild oat in the province, which is excellent news, um, sitting at about 29% uh, of fields where wild oat was collected and tested. And so this, um, we also saw a similar pattern with multiple resistance, uh, where group one and two resistance in, in the populations were present in about 24% of the fields where wild oat was collected and tested. In green foxtail, uh, group one resistance, we did see a bit of an increase um, to 22% of the fields where green foxtail is collected and tested. And now moving into some of the, the broadleaf weed species. Um, so we, we did see a steady increase in group two resistance in shepherd's purse, now increasing up to about 40% of the fields where shepherd's purse is collected and tested. Smartweed was one that, that showed up on this round of the surveys for the first time. Um, so we, we did find group two resistance in smartweed in about 33% of the fields where, where uh, the weed was collected and tested. And this follows um, a similar observation in the last round of surveys in Alberta um, in 2017, uh, where, where they found 62% of the fields where smartweed was, was tested um, showed group two resistance. Stinkweed, uh, we, we didn't see an increase in stinkweed, which is excellent news. Um, so group two resistance present in about 13% of the fields in the province, or fields where, where stinkweed was tested. Redroot pigweed was one of the shocking ones um, where we, we saw a, a pretty rapid increase um, from 10% in, in the previous round of the surveys to 52% in, in 2019 and 2020. Um, so this is one weed biotype uh, that that we'll have to keep an eye on here moving forward um, because it, it's likely to become um, a, a fairly significant problem. And of course, I mentioned that, that we only have part of the data so far, so I, I didn't show all of the weed biotypes in Saskatchewan, but uh, there, there's several other herbicide resistant weeds uh, present within the province here, just summarizing some of the data um, that we have currently. Um, so the years in which they were found, the type of resistance and the frequency with which uh, the type of resistance has been documented in the past. Um, so we will have data um, coming up for, for many of these biotypes here um, over the winter. Um, one thing to note here, um, and, and I know Hugh, uh, Becky mentioned it in the, in the previous presentation as well, that uh, group 15 here. Um, so uh, just to, to not let this confuse you, um, so trilate was reclassified by HREC uh, from a group 8 to a group 15 herbicide. So really we've had group 15 uh, resistance in wild oats since 1996. So what I wanted to do from here is uh, move on to um, the story on, on resistance in kochia um, and then also talk about some of our work on managing kochia as well. Um, so for resistance in kochia, we're, I'll start off with Alberta here. Um, initially, group two resistance across the prairies um, was found in the late 80s. And over the course of about two decades, uh, that type of resistance spread to the point where now we consider all uh, kochia populations in the prairies group two resistant. And uh, this was followed by glyphosate resistance in 2011, uh, where glyphosate resistant kochia was found initially in chemical fallow fields in Southern Alberta in Warner County here. And a survey the subsequent year in 2012 documented that about 5% of the populations in the province were glyphosate resistant. And this survey was then repeated five years later in 2017, which documented a rapid spread of glyphosate resistance in kochia populations in Alberta um, from 5% in 2012 to 50% in 2017. In addition, um, all of the populations in 2017 were group two resistant, um, but also 18% of those populations were dicamba resistant, which is a synthetic oxen mode of action or a group four. Um, 
So 10% of the populations in Alberta at the time were triple resistant to group two, group four, and group nine. And so um, we just repeated this, this um, survey or the sample collection this fall. Um, so these samples are collected post-harvest when there's viable seed on kosher plants on the lateral branches. And so we sampled um, about 300 fields across Southern Alberta. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this story continues to unfold in Alberta. And so now jumping over to Manitoba, um, we're seeing um, similar results in, in Manitoba as well. So initially um, glyphosate resistance was, was documented in 2013 in Manitoba in two populations shown by the asterisks on, on this map here. Um, and this survey was then repeated in 2018, which is, a, is what I'm showing here, uh, documenting again, rapid spread of glyphosate resistance from about 1% of the populations that were tested to now 58% of the populations in 2018. Um, and you can see this map is just showing the, the frequency with which um, glyphosate resistance was documented within co the kosher populations in each municipality showing that we, we tend to see a greater frequency of resistance in the southern municipalities and more specifically in the southwest of the province. Uh, in addition, this survey, we also documented dicamba resistance in four of the populations um, that were tested. So we were still waiting on, on the 2019 um, survey data. So my colleague, Sean Sharp from AFC Saskatoon, um, is, is leading the screening of those samples and, uh, and he'll have those, those results for you um, here shortly. But the idea here is that we're seeing similar observations in Alberta and Manitoba. It's like we're, likely that we're seeing the same thing in Saskatchewan as well. So some of our, our um, new projects, one, one is focusing on uh, further understanding oxenic herbicide resistance in kochia. And so here um, we went back to the 2017 survey of Alberta and um, screened through those populations with a different synthetic oxen herbicide, Feroxpyr, which is from a different chemical family. And here we documented that 13% of the populations in the province in 2017 um, were Feroxpyr resistant and the greatest frequency of resistance here showing up in this corridor between Lethbridge and Calgary. So the story is beginning to unfold with, with oxenic resistance in kochia on the prairies. Um, I mentioned that about 18 to 19 percent of the populations in Alberta were dicamba resistant and 13 percent were feroxpyr resistant. But interestingly, only 4 percent of the populations actually overlapped where there was cross resistance to both dicamba and feroxpyr. And, and this is sort of indicating that even if your population is confirmed resistant to one synthetic oxen, it may not have broad cross resistance to another synthetic oxen, for example. And so here we're just showing um, something similar, looking at a dose response of dicamba and feroxpyr in three kosher populations, a susceptible one here. Um, this one was classified as dicamba resistant, but feroxpyr susceptible. And then this population was actually classified as the opposite, where it was uh, Feroxpyr resistant and dicamba susceptible. So some of our other work is, is looking, bringing this out to the field now and looking at how we can manage kosher populations throughout cropping systems. Um, so here looking at a spring wheat, canola spring wheat lentil crop rotation. Um, and the idea with this project is we're, this is a fully phased rotation. So all of the phases of the rotation are present in the field in every year. In addition, we're using a herbicide layering strategy throughout this rotation. So we're, we're trying to um, implement as many um, different modes of action as we can that have activity on kochia. In addition to, to the chemical strategy, we're also adding a cultural weed management, right? So um, we're looking at wide row spacing versus narrow row spacing, as well as recommended uh, seeding rates versus double the recommended seeding rates. And so here I'm just showing on the top and the bottom two of the most contrasting um, rotation systems where we have wide rows with recommended densities versus narrow rows with double the recommended densities. And the idea here is that um, you, you can see a visual difference, first of all, in, in management of, of herbicide resistant kosher within the crop rotation um, as we also add in cultural weed management. 
And the idea here is that we have, um, we're using our more competitive crops like spring wheat and, and canola um, to um, help compete with kosher, reduce kosher biomass, reduce kosher seed production, and return to the soil seed bank. And because we know that kosher has rather limited seed longevity in the seed bank, uh, what we're doing is we're trying to dive, drive down that seed bank going into something like lentil, where there really are no um, post-emergence herbicide options for control of group two resistant kosher, which is now present across, across the prairies. So just some of the preliminary data here from the first three years of the, of the rotational study. So in 2018, 2019, 2020, um, we're looking at kosher biomass here in the wheat canola, wheat lentil crop rotation at the recommended density in wide rows, um, as well as wide rows, double the recommended density. And the same thing over here in the narrow row system as well. So the first thing to point out, um, so there wasn't a significant higher order interaction effect here, meaning that the story is a bit more simple than this. Um, but if you look at the more competitive system where we have narrow rows, double the recommended density throughout their crop rotation, um, you can see that we're seeing much less kosher biomass in, in the more competitive rotation. Charles, just wanted to let you know, we've got about uh, just over four minutes left here. Perfect, thank you. Um, so some of these data now, um, we're looking at, again, an impact of crop rotation phase by year here. And this is to be expected because I mentioned previously um, about the, the lack of effective post-emergence herbicides in lentil for kosher control. We would expect greater biomass in, in the lentil crop. Uh, but more interestingly, moving into um, seeding rate now, um, we did see an effective seeding rate in 2020, which was the year where we received the greatest precipitation, where kosher biomass was reduced among all of the crops phases in the rotation by 74%. Um, and more consistently with row spacing, um, looking at wide versus narrow row spacing among all of the crop rotation phases and all of the years, using a, a more narrow row spacing, decreased kosher biomass by 60% consistently. So some of our other work is looking at diversity of crop rotations as well. Here again, just pulling out the spring wheat, canola, spring wheat, lentil crop rotation. Um, and one of the things that we're doing is trying to um, implement different crop life cycles. So you'll see a similar rotation here on the bottom, but instead of spring wheat, we have winter wheat. Um, and the idea being that winter wheat is more established in the spring, uh, closes its canopy earlier, helps compete with kochia, and it's also harvested before kochia produces viable seed. Um, so we're driving down that seed bank going into lentil, and you can see the visual difference in lentil here. Um, and out in the field this year, um, it was pretty difficult to find a kochia plant in the winter wheat, and a similar for the perennial system uh, in the third year of establishment of alfalfa meadow brome. So the other part is that um, when we're designing effective cropping systems that target uh, specific weed species, it's important to understand the phenology of the weed as well as the crop. So some of our other research is looking at um, the phenology of seed production in kochia. Here just showing some of the uh, preliminary work on, on the impact of kochia emergent state on seed production potential. So here showing that the earlier a kosher plant emerges, the greater seed it can produce. Um, as we move later in the season, that declines. So just to add some calendar dates here based on climactic normals, kosher can emerge as late as early August and still produce viable seed before the end of the year. Something else that we're looking at is when does the seed actually become viable on the kosher plant? So if we transfer these dates over um, kosher seed viability tends to begin in late August and increases rapidly throughout September. The interesting part though is when you overlap these two curves, um, we can come up with what I'm calling a critical period for weed seed control in kosher, which is the period of the growing season where effective management will um, help prevent seed production and return to the soil seed bank. Um, here shown to be somewhere in mid-August, which tends to coincide with, with harvest of a winter cereal, for example. Um, so some of our new research is looking at how um, post-emergence, and, and, or sorry, post uh, pre and post-harvest herbicides impact this period and, and lengthen it. 
as well as extending this to several other weed species um, that are problematic in Western Canada. Um, so here, just showing an aerial view of, of one of our sites in collaboration with Brianne Tideman and Lacombe. Um, so I'll end it there and uh, thank everyone for listening, as well as um, thank our, our generous funders that, that fund our research program and the technical staff, students and co-investigators, without whom this, this research would not be possible. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Geddes, for your informative update on herbicide resistance. Any questions, just as a reminder, uh, can be sent to us via the question box and we'll address them in the Q&A portion at the end of today's sessions. Next, I would like to introduce Jessica Enns, who is presenting on lentil weed control. Jessica Enns is a general manager for the Western Applied Research Corporation based at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Scott, Saskatchewan. Jessica has been with WORK since 2015. She completed her Bachelor of Science in Plant Science with a major in Agronomy and a minor in Agribusiness and completed her Master of Science in Plant Sciences with a focus on weed crop competition and weed control in Western Canada at the University of Saskatchewan under Dr. Christian Willenberg and Eric Johnson. Her research activities with WARC cover a broad range of agronomic issues and crop types with a focus on applied research and helping develop practical solutions to today's farming challenges. Because Jessica was unable to join us live, her session has also been pre-recorded and will not be available for the Q&A today, but we will be sure to forward any questions you send in to Jessica, so please post them in the questions box and we will follow up with her answers following today's session. Hi, my name is Jessica Enns. I'm the General Manager of the Western Applied Research Corporation. And today I wanna to talk about herbicide layering in lentils. So first off, I wanna talk about what the difference is between rotation, tank mix, and layering. Rotation is we take two or more herbicides that are selected for crop situation and these are used in alternate years. So the basic concept is you take one herbicide, you spray it, and then you don't spray that again for another year or two. Now the reason behind this is so that if you don't use a herbicide very often, you reduce its selection pressure and hopefully delay resistance. Now this is a, re a relatively good control option. However, it doesn't reduce selection pressure that much. A better alternative would be to use a tank mix, and that's when you use multiple combinations of multiple modes of actions. Now, when you're using a tank mix, you really wanna make sure that you're actually including different modes that control both your grasses and your broadleaves. So if you're controlling grasses, you wanna use multiple, say say group two, group six, group four, whatever it is, and make sure that you use multiple modes, not just one mode of action for your grass and one mode of action for your broadleaf. Now, when I talk about herbicide layering, this is typically your best option. And the reason for that is because you're using these products in a sequence. So why this works is when you use a pre-seed residual product, something like Focus, you can control your weeds early on. And then you come in later with an in-crop application and control those weeds that have escaped the first application. So you have a lot more uh, control and a lot less selection pressure on those weeds that may have escaped in just a regular combination of a tank mix. Now, why is this important in lentils? Well, we know that lentils are a really poor competitor and we know that they're highly susceptible to yield loss. We found that you can get up to a 40% yield loss if you have a lot of herbicide resistant weeds or just regular weeds in your lentil crop. Now, the reason we have such an issue is because we really don't have a lot of in-crop options. We really rely on our group two products. And because of that, we have a lot of herbicide resistant weeds. We've got kochia, we've got wild mustard, we've got stinkweed. So we have a huge issue in controlling the weeds that are currently in our lentil crops. So a lot of people are saying, well, why do I even bother growing lentils? They're such a pain to control these weeds. Well, because a weed canal rotation just isn't sustainable and it just isn't profitable long-term. And that's because there's a multiple reasons that it's just not sustainable. First off, you're gonna have a disease buildup, whether or not it's club root or black leg or take all, tan spot. All of these diseases can be managed through a crop rotation. When you talk about your insects, we know that flea beetles are worse if you grow canola after canola after canola. The same with weak stem sawfly, wireworms, cutworms, all managed by crop rotation. We know that in terms of fertility, that canola hybrids and wheat remove high amounts of soil nitrate and we're constantly depleting our soil nitrate levels. And so we're constantly having to improve or increase the amount of fertilizer that we're replacing. 
And this can be really expensive, especially considering the cost of fertilizer that's going up and up and up. Now, the other factor that you want to consider is moisture. We know that high-yielding canola uses a lot of moisture in the first two to three feet of your topsoil. The same for wheat. So if you continue to use that rotation, you're going to be depleting your soil water reserves. This is going to be an issue, especially if we have drought years in the following two to three years. Now, lastly is our concern for weed control. We know that tight rotations can sometimes increase the selection pressure for specific weeds, especially difficult to control weeds. So for example, volunteer canola, weeds that are difficult to control, they become more resistant because it's a tight rotation, you're using a limited amount of herbicides or a spectrum that constantly gets being overused. And so we have a higher selection pressure and a higher density of herbicide resistant weeds. So now that we know why we should be using herbicide layer, I want to talk about some of the projects that we have. So the one that I want to talk about is called a lentil input study. We did this for three years over five different locations. And the main factor that I just really want to highlight for this presentation is our pre-seed weed burn off. So we used glyphosate in the spring and focus in glyphosate. And what we found is that 73% of the time it was more effective than just glyphosate alone. So 11 out of 14 site years. Now that's quite substantial. We also found that there was a 66% increase in our annual weed control. Now to take that, we also know that then 27% of the time our residual herbicide either didn't work as well or the glyphosate worked even better than our focus. Um, and this could have been for multiple reasons. Sometimes the weeds just weren't in a control spectrum, uh, poor soil activation, there was a multitude of reasons. But it only happened 27% of the time. So we're pretty happy with the amount of control that we got with our focus product. Now when we look at our weed density and our weed biomass, what we found is that the use of a herbicide like focus was the most effective tool in reducing our weed density and our weed biomass. We found a 76% reduction. So there's a 66% reduction in our weed establishment and a 76% reduction in our weed biomass. Now this was over 15 site years, so that's pretty substantial. We also found that it was usually profitable if we used a residual product when our weed densities were greater than five plants per square foot. So five plants is not that many. That's typically what you would find in a farmer's field. And so we usually found that if you use a residual product, you usually could make your money back by gaining that in yield. Now, another product or another trial that I really want to talk about is our pre-seed options. And we did this at four different locations. We did it at Scott, Redverse, Saskatoon, and Swift Current in 2020. And what we did is we focused on nine different products and then we used these in different combinations. So we had Roundup, Heat LQ, which is a group 14. We had Goldwing, which is a group four and a 14. Express SG, Zidua, which is a group 14. Focus, which has 14 and 15. And we use this in both the fall and the spring. We had Edge Granular, we had Volterra EZ, and we had Fierce. Now I said we use these in different combinations, and so we had actually 16 different treatments. Um, the control was in crop solo only, and then we had our standard, which is just your glyphosate pre-seed, glyphosate with your heat LQ, and then of course glyphosate and gold wing, and so on and so forth for 16 different combinations. So when we look at what was the least effective, we base this on our visual phytotoxicity ratings. So these were done at 7 to 14, 14 and 28, and 56 days after application. And so what we found is in-crop solo was the least effective. And that really isn't a surprise considering that most of the weeds that we we're trying to control are group 2 resistant. Now, the other one that was really ineffective was our spring applied glyphosate. It had really inconsistent control. And because it's glyphosate, there is no residual component. Now the third one was spring applied glyphosate and heat LQ. Heat LQ does have some sort of a residual component to it, but we just found that it was incredibly inconsistent and it really only had a suppression of kosher rather than a control 
So it really didn't give us the control we were looking for. So to give you an idea, these were photos taken at 56 days after application at Scott. So first off, you can see the control was solo only. You can see that there's lamb's quarters, mustard, kochia, um, a variety of weeds that were not controlled with solo. And then we had spring applied glyphosate and it was slightly better, but you can still see there was quite a bit of misses. And we have our glyphosate and our heat LQ. And this one is better than the two alternatives that we discussed, but we can still see quite a bit of kochia in this. Um, they're more difficult to see because they're shorter. There was a lot of um, kochia and mustard and canola as well. So once again, just not that great of control. Now, when we talk about our most consistent, we discussed it as over 80% of the visual rating. And so when we looked in terms of wild mustard control, we found the combination of fall focus, spring applied heat and glyphosate, and then fall fierce and spring applied gold wing and glyphosate. Now in terms of volunteer canola, we found that fall Volterra and glyphosate, fall Volterra and glyphosate with gold wing, and fall fierce with gold wing and glyphosate. And then for our kochia control, once again, we found that combination of fall Volterra and spring applied glyphosate, fall fierce and spring applied glyphosate, fall fierce with gold wing and glyphosate. So you can really see that the similar trend between all of these is the residual component, typically Volterra and Fierce, and then typically Goldwing. So that was a really popular combination that we found to be the most effective. And then when we looked at it, all three weeds over all four locations, we found that Fall Fierce and Spring Applied Glyphosate with Goldwing was the most consistent combination. So to give you an idea of what it looked like, our Fall Focus and Spring Applied Heat LQ and Glyphosate once again, it looks quite good, but we did have some misses, especially there was kochia in there. They're more difficult to see in this photo, but they were there. We had fall Volterra and spring glyphosate. Once again, the odd miss, but it was quite clean. And then the most successful combinations were fall Volterra and spring applied gold wing and glyphosate, and fall fierce with spring applied glyphosate. And then, of course, the most effective combination that we found, where we almost had, say, around 98% control, we are quite happy with this combination, was Fall Fierce and Spring Applied Gold Wing and Glyphosate. Now, in terms of yield, we found that the lowest yielding across all four sites was our in-crop solo, our Spring Applied Glyphosate, our Spring Applied Glyphosate with heat, and our Spring Applied Gold Wing and Glyphosate. So the common denominator between these is just Spring Applied. Whenever we used a residual component, however, and those are treatments 5 to 16, we found that all the yields were relatively similar. We found that the most effective herbicide combination for weed control had a 12% yield increase over our lowest yielding of just in crop solo. So overall, we were pretty happy with what we saw in terms of yield control. Um, and that in general, if you use a residual component, you're usually going to get enough control that you're going to get a yield benefit. Now, we did an additional study here in Scott in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And what we found was once again, that residual component really was what was necessary to control our kosher populations. So you can see in this graph that glyphosate and glyphosate heat LQ had anywhere between 50 and 60 plants per square foot of kosher, which is quite a bit. There was quite a dense population. And then we used EDGE and we didn't incorporate it. And we did see a reduction in our kosha population. And then we used FOCUS, Volterra, Fierce, and then EDGE when we harrowed it. And those were quite effective in reducing our kosha populations. And then when we just looked at our mustard control, we found that EDGE worked, but not as good as FOCUS. And then Fierce was better. And then the best one was Volterra. So you can see here that, once again, Volterra and Fierce were really the two products that we found to be the most effective year after year after year. So what have we learned? Well, when we look at all of our data, which is 21 site years, which is quite a bit, we can find that the residual products are consistently better than just glyphosate alone. And that's regardless of the soil texture, the environmental conditions, the weeds that were present, they were just that much more effective than just glyphosate alone. When we looked at a total of seven site years, we found that typically Voltaire and Fierce, depending on the weed that you're looking for, were fairly similar. Uh, and then Focus did fairly well, but there was a little bit more escapes. And then Edge did okay, but once again, a little bit more. 
issues with that one. Now, all of them, though, were better than glyphosate alone and glyphosate with keto-Q. In terms of crop injury, we were fairly happy uh, with the amount of tolerance that the lentils displayed, and all combinations were seen deemed acceptable. Now, we went over these fairly quickly, so if you guys do have any more questions, uh, we do have these final reports on our website. SAS Pulse has these reports as well. Um, but of course, you can contact me. My email is jessica.ends at work.ca. So with that, if you have any questions, have any I just questions, want to thank you for your time. time. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you if you have anything on your mind. And, uh, of course, First, you can always contact can always me. Contact. Thank you so much for your thank time. You so much. Thank you to Jessica for sharing your presentation. Any questions for Jessica can be typed into the question box and we will be sure to get them addressed after the workshop. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeff Shano, who is going to present on fertility decisions for pulses after a dry year. Dr. Shano is a professor of soil fertility and a professional agrologist who works in the Department of Soil Science at the University of Saskatchewan. He holds the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture Soil Nutrient Management Chair in the Agriculture uh, College and is a fellow of the Agricultural Institute of Canada. He was born in Saskatchewan, completed his undergraduate and graduate degrees in the 1980s in the College of Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan and has worked there since. His research, teaching and ex extension activities deal with soil fertility and fertilizers, nutrient cycling and soil management practices in prairie cropping systems. Welcome Dr. Shano. Great, uh, thanks Allison. I assume everybody can hear me well and see my screen. Yes, it looks great, Dr. Sheena. Excellent, excellent. No, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak a little bit about this uh, uh, topic here. I'm just going to hide my picture here. Okay, there we are. Great. I can see my slides here. Yes, I think uh, uh, what I'm going to talk to you folks a little bit about this morning are fertility considerations in pulse crops for 2022, and and in the time that I have available, really to to, I think, emphasize fertility decisions uh, after a dry year. And uh, a couple of topics that the organizers asked that I would, would talk about specifically are pulses as a nutrient scavenger and pulses on high residual nitrogen soils. And I think these are both uh, uh, considerations that are important given last year with a fair bit of residual nutrient left behind as a result of, of low crop yields uh, uh, that we need to think about uh, in terms of, of, of what the implications are. So, of course, that, that reduced crop yield uh, translates into uh, reduced nutrient removal. And as a result, uh, high residual nutrient levels in a lot of fields out there, folks, uh, that have been reported. And then when we think about this and in combination with, with what we might be expecting to pay for fertilizer uh, in the upcoming growing season, I think that really means that, that soil nutrient availability assessment is, is more important than, than ever. And, and lots of folks have been out there uh, sampling soils and doing nutrient assessments uh, uh, this fall. And uh, this uh, uh, lack of crop uptake and, and leaving a nutrient behind in bands has presented some particular challenges in, in sampling. Uh, if we think about uh, uh, the, the higher degree of micro scale variability that exists out there. So for example, if you're out there taking cores, you, you don't want to bias by, by uh, taking your, more of your samples uh, from the uh, uh, fertilizer bands than what actually exists across that seed area. So, uh, you know, some, some rules of thumb come into play for for example, if you've got uh, a band spacing of 30 centimeters, uh, a, a rule of thumb is that you would take uh, uh, one core out of that band and another eight cores in between the band to represent that, that seed bed area uh, uh, very well in your composite sample. Uh, you can also go along and do the strip sampling and, and, and take soil uh, as you move along across the seed bed area, uh, including both that uh, residual fertilizer band and the areas uh, in between in the sample that you take out of that uh, out of that field so a uh, good soil sampling is is more important than 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 ever and uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of micro scale variability that can exist and we're talking about variation here over just a, a few centimeters it can be large and some work that uh, Blake Wiseth did in his master's student back in 2014 uh, and those were actually pretty good growing conditions that year uh, and this was with soybean 
Uh, following harvest, uh, we took some uh, monoliths or slabs of soil out of the field from plots and looked at the uh, distribution of uh, available phosphorus uh, within the seed row and extending out vert vertically, or extending out horizontally, I should say, and, uh, and vertically as well. So uh, subsampling over a very small area and looking at available phosphorus levels in, uh, in, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, zone. And so these are the soil test p-values in the fall after harvest that we got from those individual sampling locations on that monolith uh, in our unfertilized control and, and also where we had seed placed a, a small amount of phosphorus, 20 pounds of P2O5 per acre. And as you can see there, folks, in the unfertilized control where we didn't add any phosphorus, we've got a pretty uniform distribution of available phosphorus there uh, across that uh, uh, seed bed area. Uh, the levels do decrease uh, as we go down deeper as, as we would expect. Where we had the phosphorus seed placed and we got a, a, a yield response to that added phosphorus in the soybean and increased phosphorus uptake, we can still see some, some residual phosphorus uh, left behind, creating a, a microscale variability with those elevated levels present in the seed row uh, following harvest. So we really want to, to make sure that our, our sampling strategy does indeed account for all of that soil that's present there in that seed bed area in our composite sample. And when we're talking about phosphorus, we certainly recognize as well that, that legumes have high phosphorus requirements. Indeed, that biological nitrogen fixation process that, that is so important in, in legumes requires lots of energy, and phosphorus is the energy currency of life. And of course, for phosphorus, unlike nitrogen, that we can get a, a significant proportion derived from biological nitrogen fixation, all of that phosphorus has to come from the, from the soil and fertilizer. And about 75% of the phosphorus in a mature pulse crop is in the seed, which is removed in the, in the harvest operation. But fortunately, uh, pulse crops are, are good nutrient scavengers. And uh, I think that, that they should be able to, to, to rather effectively utilize the residual unused phosphorus and also other nutrients like potassium, sulfur, and micronutrients that are, are left behind in the seed row and the bands from, the, from 2021. Of course, uh, because of that, that, that low crop removal as a result of drought uh, uh, translating into increased soil residual nutrient, that those pulse crops uh, should be able to do a pretty good job of, of accessing and utilizing. And uh, that's because uh, the, the legumes in general are, are, are what we call a, a strong mycorrhizal crop and that they develop a, a strong symbiotic associations with AM mycorrhizae that are shown there in that figure there that that mycorrhizal fungal hyphae effectively extend that rooting uh, 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 surface uh, further in the soil, increase the root surface area and, and impart ability to, 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 to better scavenge uh, nutrients that are immobile, particularly like phosphorus and potassium, but also other nutrients as well, like, like sulfur and, and micros from the, from the soil. And, and so for that reason, legumes can often mobilize and access that phosphorus already present in the soil better than a lot of other crops can. The other thing that those legume roots can do is they can acidify the root zone, and that acidification in our calcareous soils helps to solubilize those calcium phosphates that are common in prairie soils. And especially as we get down into the subsoils, we've got a lot of very insoluble calcium phosphates, and those legume roots do a good job of, 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 of by virtue of, of dropping the pH, bringing that phosphate into solution. And that really explains why, why pulses are sometimes not highly responsive to, to pea fertilization compared to other crops. They're really good uh, as scavengers. And that's really, I think, a, a benefit uh, where we want to, 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 to maybe increase our reliance on, on residual phosphorus fertile la left behind from, from last year and years past to, in order to reduce the, perhaps the dollars that are gonna be spent on, on fertilizer in that pulse crop uh, in the upcoming season. But we do need to remember as well, folks, that, that anything that's going to restrict, create problems with the roots, with the root growth, like disease that we heard lots about uh, uh, last day and, la and yesterday's session, a drought, saturation, uh, something uh, we haven't encountered too much uh, uh, recently, but I remember back in, in 2011, 2012, lots of water. Interferes with root growth, residual herbicide injury, anything that affects the, negatively the, the, those roots are going to reduce the ability of that plant 
to access that nutrient. And that's especially true for the immobile nutrients like phosphorus and potassium that move by diffusion that are really dependent, as I said, on root density and surface area to access those nutrients. Also, uh, problems with roots can also certainly shut down that biological nitrogen fixation. The kind of plant disease in there, root rots that, that cause that girdling around the base of the stem, uh, very much interfere with the uh, translocation of photosynthate down to those nodules, effectively cut off the food supply to the rhizobium that, fi that fix the nitrogen and, and reduce that, that, that contribution from, from atmospheric nitrogen fixation. And so for that reason, folks, uh, under adverse conditions uh, that are, are negatively impacting the roots, sometimes we do see more response to added phosphorus and, and, and starter in. And, and this, I guess, is a kind of a, of a Band-Aid, uh, applying more fertilizer when, you're, when your roots are negatively impacted. And we hope that indeed we can get to the source of that problem uh, and, and solve the problem with the roots to, uh, to begin with. We want to be checking for what's there, certainly, and, and adjust the, the rate that we're applying accordingly for, for sufficiency. Uh, some folks use the, the maintenance approach in their fertility program uh, for phosphorus, for example, uh, in, in long-term planning, uh, trying to put back in what they're taking out. And we do want to make sure that we account in that plan for the reduced crop removal that we experienced from reduced yield uh, under the drought conditions of, of 2021. Uh, a kind of a rule of thumb for, for pulse crops in general, we get about one pound of P2O5, a plant P uptake per bushel of, of grain yield, and that's the total uptake in the plant. And anywhere from 60 to 80% of that uptake is contained in the grain, which is removed. And, and some of our work uh, has shown that that proportion tends to be lower for lentil, greatest for faba bean. Those details can be found in the Ministry of Agriculture's uh, pea fertilization and crop production uh, fact sheet. But uh, you take 75% of that total plant uptake, uh, that's removed in the grain, and it's one pound of P2O5 uh, uh, of plant P uptake per acre, you're looking at about three quarters of a pound of P2O5 per acre that's removed in that in that grain that you you would need to to replace. And of course, when the grain yield is reduced, so also is the uptake in the balance calculations. So I'd like to move on then uh, to the second uh, component of, of my talk, and that is really what are considerations when we're thinking about growing pulses on high residual nitrogen soils. I know in our trials that we had in southern Saskatchewan this year, as looking out there on, on some trials with spring wheat, uh, uh, we didn't get a whole lot of yield there, about seven or eight bushels per acre, I think, in that particular trial. So there's a lot of residual nitrogen left behind in the, uh, in the uh, uh, soil uh, from uh, uh, nitrogen application that was made in 2021 that wasn't used by the, by the crop. And... That has implications in what we might expect to see come from biological nitrogen fixation. What we're talking about there is nitrogen that's derived from the air, converted into usable plant nitrogen through that symbiosis with rhizobium in those nodules on the legume roots. As we see there, those nodules cut open, showing that nice uh, a beefy red color or pinkish color that indicates the presence of leg hemoglobin that helps that enzyme nitrogenase uh, effectively carry out that nitrogen fixation uh, process. And we can get, on average, uh, under good conditions, 70 to 80 percent of the nitrogen in that legume coming from the atmosphere by a biological fixation in that nodule. Conditions that contribute to maximum contribution from biological nitrogen fixation, low soil available nitrogen, and good growing conditions. Anything that negatively affects the plant is going to negatively affect fixation. But the main impact of growing that pulse crop on soil with high available nitrogen levels is going to be that the contribution from biological nitrogen fixation will be reduced. Generally, the plant will do fine, but it will use the inorganic nitrogen from the soil as a nitrogen source rather than sending the food to the rhizobia to get that fixed nitrogen from the air. So effectively, by growing it on soil, growing that legume on soils with high available end, you're cutting yourself out from that benefit from getting an external input, so to speak, for, for free from the atmosphere. So some kind of general uh, rule of thumb, again, if your soil available nitrogen plus your fertilizer nitrogen uh, is, is around 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre, uh, at that level, you start to see nitrogen fixation uh, start to be negatively affected. 
And once you get above about 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre, uh, you'll probably see a significant reduction in the proportion of nitrogen in that plant that is derived from the biological nitrogen fixation. And that comes from the Ministry of Agriculture inoculation of pulse crops uh, fact sheet. We had a look at this more recently uh, in some work that we did with soybean. Uh, Harshini Dona, a graduate student working with me, uh, looked at the percentage of soybean nitrogen derived from fixation in a soil in southern Saskatchewan. This soil had about uh, 22 kilograms of nitrate nitrogen per hectare in the top foot before seeding and fertilization, or about 20 pounds of nitrate nitrogen uh, per acre. Uh, we had uh, fertilization rates, and we were adding uh, um, a blend of urea and monoammonium phosphate phosphate uh, together uh, as our fertilizers. So we had rates of 0, 10, and 20, and 30 uh, kilograms of N, and also P205 per hectare. And what you can see there, folks, is that up to about 10 kilograms of N per hectare, uh, really no significant effect on the proportion of nitrogen derived from the, uh, from the air. But once we got up to 30 kilograms of, of nitrogen per hectare, we did see a significant reduction in the proportion of nitrogen derived from fixation in both the grain and the straw. So that 30 plus the 20 that we had in the, in the soil uh, uh, in that zero to 12 inch depth before seeding and fertilization uh, adds up to about 50, agrees very well with, with, with what is reported and, and generally considered in, in, in as a, a level of, at which you, you're, you're gonna see significant reduction in, in fixation as pointed out and, and indicated in the uh, inoculation uh, uh, and uh, nitrogen fixation guidelines that we have in the province here. So that highest rate significantly decreased the proportion of N derived from fixation. Uh, and so what we're doing there really focus, folks is we're reducing that legume benefit of free nitrogen coming from the atmosphere and using the soil and the residual nitrogen fertilizer instead. And under those conditions where you got a lot of available nitrogen in that soil, uh, that available nitrogen may be better used by selecting a crop that can't fix its own nitrogen from the air like a, like a legume, like a pulse crop can. Just to show this, uh, every year in my Soil Science 312 Soil Fertility and Fertilizers class, uh, we do a demonstration looking at the effect of high available nitrogen levels in the soil on growth of, 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 of legumes, different uh, pulse crops, uh, including uh, the nodulation on the roots. Here we see uh, peas that had received no nitrogen and 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare as ammonium nitrate. We use a very high rate there because the volume of, of soil in the, in the pots is small. Uh, as you can see there, a little bit more biomass there where we've added all that nitrogen. And that can be a bit of an issue as well with the high available nitrogen uh, in a soil uh, uh, for a, a, a pulse crop that uh, it may cause a, a, a lot of vegetative growth that could uh, result in some problems with uh, uh, lodging, for example, or and or increased uh, incidence of, of disease. Uh, for soybean, uh, this picture here, uh, showing again with soybean here, uh, uh, a little bit darker green color where we have all that nitrogen available. Soybeans tend to be a little bit slower to get started in the nitrogen fixation process. So we, we do see a little bit more biomass there on uh, above, above ground from that, uh, from that high available nitrogen. Uh, we look at both the shoots and the roots of peas there, and, and in all cases, our, 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 our legumes here are inoculated with appropriate rhizobial inoculated, uh, no nitrogen added, uh, nitrogen added. Uh, we can see there actually in that case, not much difference in, in the pea plants there. The soybeans again, look like a little bit more response uh, uh, to that uh, uh, high available nitrogen versus no nitrogen at all. I think the real difference here though, folks, shows up when you zero in and look at the roots. Here we have the soybeans with no nitrogen added, inoculated soybeans. You can see lots of nodules there. Uh, the nodules have a nice uh, red uh, or pinkish color there indicating active fixation, whereas those inoculated soybeans that were growing with high levels of available nitrogen, you look there, folks, you cannot find one nodule on those, uh, on those roots. So your percent NDFA there would be very close to close to zero in that case. 
So some final thoughts to wrap up. I think pulses uh, can make really good use of a residual phosphorus left behind from past years. Even as those fertilizer phosphorus reaction products age in our soils and become less soluble over a, a number of months and years, uh, really the penalty from growing that legume on soil of high available land uh, is mainly the reduced contribution of free nitrogen from that biological nitrogen fixation process. And we really need to be looking at the roots and what's happening to them, folks, because anything that hurts that root growth and function is going to negatively impact uh, a biological nitrogen fixation and also the ability of that plant to access uh, other soil nutrients like phosphorus, potassium, sulfur micronutrients. And we really want to get to the root of the problem, so to speak, and uh, have as, as good a root system as we can in order to maximize that contribution from fixation and give that crop the best ability to access nutrients in the soil. So with that, I think I've used up my 20 minutes and uh, thank you very much, folks. Thank you, Dr. Shano, for that presentation. Uh, looks like we're getting some great questions coming in. And so just a reminder to keep typing those questions into the questions box on your GoToWebinar panel, and we will address them uh, once the panel at the end, in the panel discussion at the end of the workshop. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tyler Wist, who's going to present a Pulse Insect Research Update, which includes pea aphids and ligus. Dr. Wist is a research scientist in field crop entomology at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Saskatoon Research and Development Centre. He's happiest when chasing insects through fields with a net or a camera and lives for making at Field Heroes videos of beneficial insects destroying crop pests. He has a strange passion for aphids, which draws him into work on those and other insects in canola, wheat, canary seed, quinoa, and to be presented here in this talk, several different pulses such as peas, lentils, and faba beans. This presentation was co-authored by Sean Frazier, Assistant Professor of Entomology with the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome, Dr. West. Hey, thank you very much, Allison, for that introduction. Thank you to the SAS Pulse Growers Association for inviting me. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening. So I, uh, I changed the title last minute, just because I like the uh, Wizard of Oz. So calling it Ligus Bugs, P. aphids and Fava, oh my. And I dropped any talk of lentils in here, just because we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm going to talk about uh, lagus bugs and faba bean, and then aphids and faba bean, and rely heavily on the master's work that uh, Ning has been doing under the guidance of Sean. So here's the lagus bugs. So if these pictures look familiar here, they're from our AAFC bug guide book. And they show four of the main pest species of lagus bugs that we get in the prairies. So there's about five species that will cause issues. And you want to start worrying about lagus bugs in your field when you see these dots on the back of the nymphs. So there's the nymph it doesn't have wings. These guys all have wings here. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into details on the species because any kind of thresholds that are developed for lagus doesn't really matter what species we've got. So in most pulse crops, you don't really need to worry too much about, about uh, ligus bugs. There is a threshold in lentils, but in fava bean, uh, which of course stays green kind of late in the year, you can get these feeding spots. And the feeding spots, if you have uh, even less than 1% of these, you can get downgraded from food grade to feed grade. And so, Lagus can cost a lot of money in faba bean because of that downgrading. And so there's not a whole lot of work done there. So um, they've got piercing sucking mouth parts and that's how they're able to make these feeding scars. But they also inject a digestive enzyme. And so you get this black response on there. Now lagus is highly mobile and they'll move around from crop to crop depending on what's going on. So you'll get alfalfa crops getting cut and then the ligus bugs pick up and leave. And if it's the right time of year, you'll find them in fava. So Sean Prager has been receiving ligus bug samples from about 20 fields for the last few years. And SAS Crop Insurance and the SAS Ministry of Agriculture have been uh, taking those sweeps and sending them in. So these are just based on 10 sweeps per site. And so not a whole lot of ligus in the last few years. And uh, Hector Carcamo and I like to joke that it's because he's had a project on ligus for the last few years that we haven't had any ligus bugs. 
So most of the fields had no lagus, and there were just a few kind of down in the bottom southeast corner here, and just an average of four per field. And here's our maximum of 21. So 2018, they didn't do the lagus monitoring because there wasn't really a whole lot of lagus in 2017. But some anecdotal reports from 2018 prompted the survey to continue again. There were kind of two hot spots up in the north now. And so the mean's gone up a bit and the maximum is up a bit as well too. And so most of the lagus were found up in the, the more northerly parts of Saskatchewan. And in 2020, you can actually see the distribution there. And okay, Allison, do you see that? Did my screen just quit? There we go. Okay, we're back up. And you can actually see the frequency. There were no fields with with uh, zero lagus. And so our maximum here was 44. And so the lagus population was starting to come up. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. It keeps kicking out on me. So 2021, we actually had a lot more lagus than even before. So a maximum of 75. And the fava beans on this survey were just not doing very well. And so five of the fields were harvested in advance. So we go. So if I look at my own sweeps from 2021, I actually have quite a few lagus bugs in uh, in other crops like quinoa for example got a picture from my tech yesterday and it was pretty horrible in there but what i really like to talk about today are p aphids so this is another piercing sucking insect and they damage the plants by sucking out phloem but they can also inject viruses as well so ning's project her msc project she's looking at viral transmission she's also looking at the damage that uh, these bugs can cause by doing their phloem feeding so P. aphids, you'll find them in all the major pulse crops in Western Canada. And the only real recommendations we've got are from pea crops. Uh, there's a nominal threshold in lentils of about 30 to 40 per sweep. And the pea work came out of the 1980s from AAFC Winnipeg, where Bob Lamb and his students kind of looked at this and found that you had two aphids per tip or nine to 12 aphids in one sweep at flowering, you were at an economic threshold there. And that was done on an old um, variety of peas called Century. So fava bean has had really no work done on it. But if you look at this picture down here, the green plants down here is where I was cleaning out my sprayer. I was using a backpack sprayer. Up here is where some of the plots were sprayed. And here was just the rest of the field. So you can see the difference there in a really strong pea aphid year. And that was 2019. So here's Ning over here. She was cutting out plots from the fava bean. And I like this picture because she's just covered in fava bean pieces. And here's a close up of pea aphids all over the fava bean. And you can see the plants are kind of looking wilty. So we got a project going and I've got the viruses in small because I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about fava bean and not lentils just because this is kind of breaking news. The fava bean work is, is ready. The lentil stuff is on its way. We're trying to find economic thresholds. So that's what the ET stands for, for both lentils and fava bean. And so Ning's going to have a really heavy thesis by the time she's done, because we've all done a lot of work on this project. So these aphids are kind of a late season pest, sort of like the lagus bugs as well. And we don't have any thresholds or real sampling methods for fava bean. So the, uh, the same things that are registered in most crops for pea aphid control are also registered in fava bean. And so in this project, we're using Matador, Volume Express, and then another one that is the group 28 version of Volume Express with the Lambda Sahelothrin taken out. Here's a nice fun slide. This is what happens when you sweep in lentils that are heavily infested with peas or in fava bean as well. You get a lot of pea aphids. So I got a student to count how many pea aphids were in a cup. And so it is just over 38,000 pea aphids. And um, what, we're, what we've been using in the fava bean are counts per plant. So you get a lot of aphids when you're sweeping fava bean. Uh, you also do when you're sweeping lentil and you've got an infestation, but uh, the fava bean counts per plant seem to be working out better. So more work yet to be done on, on the sampling efficacy of all of those. So we used CDC Snowdrop, 
for all of our site years and set up five different aphid densities. And it was replicated at three sites in 2019 and then four sites in 2020, all around the Saskatoon area, so we could get to it. And here are the insecticides. I'm not gonna touch too much on the insecticides, except to say that the rapid knockdown of Lambda Cyhalothrin was just better than the slow burn of Cyanthranilipril. And uh, yeah, one of the sites got lost. I just like this picture because it shows you more potential insects that you'll find in your pulses. This is a Nuttall's blister beetle. Their larvae are parasitic on solitary bees, so at no point in this guy's life cycle is it a beneficial insect. But the ash gray blister beetle, its larvae are predatory on grasshopper eggs. And so these two wiped out a very small site that we had in 2019 just by damaging the plants too much. So here's our CDC snowdrop, just absolutely covered in pea aphids. And so you can see them there. And it's a non tannin variety. Now, the pea aphid population growth, we are talking about it in something called cumulative aphid days. And so this is a measure of the number of aphids on a plant, but also how long they've been on the plant for. And so it takes into account the length of feeding and the number that they've got. So all of our sites are down here. And this is our 2019 site at Llewellyn. So you can see we had a lot of cumulative aphid day pressure at that Llewellyn site. So when we're looking at aphid populations, if you can put a black line on there, it shows that your population is just increasing without anything acting upon it. And so that was Llewellyn 2019 and the Saskatoon farm site 2019. So using this equation here, we can calculate things like doubling time of the population using their reproductive rate. And then I'll throw out another term here. This is EIL, and that's the economic injury level. So this is where your yield loss equals the cost of control. And so it actually comes after the economic threshold. So you set an economic threshold before the economic injury level, so you don't actually hit that economic injury level. And you can use the population times of the pea aphids to decide where that economic threshold goes. So back in 2019, here's our three different densities. And so our first two densities were okay. By the time we hit our third density, we basically had lost all of the yield in our plots. And so here's a density four plants and the pods are shriveled up and black. You can still see aphids on there. Here's our density one where we sprayed at that first density and we've got nice and full pods. So you can actually see the differences as well over on the right hand side between density three and density four where we kind of just had dead sticks. So here's our Llewellyn field. And what we found here was that we went from density two to our density three really rapidly. And so we have a big jump in the number of aphids per plant at these two different densities. And so what we see is, okay, yield here, and then absolutely no yield by the time we got up to here. So looking at our Llewellyn field, somewhere in between here is that economic injury level and the economic threshold. So the Saskatoon field in 2019 wasn't as badly pressured. And so here's a nice decrease of yield that you can see as the number of aphids per plant goes up. And then there's our density four. We never actually got to our density five because um, apparently we, we set that cumulative aphid density a little bit high. You can see the decrease in yield, but still about 280 aphids per plant were in that same range as the other two densities. So this is, uh, it gets a bit confusing, but when we're looking at the two fields here, I've put on the progression of the crop as well. So S stands for our Saskatoon site. And at our first flowering is when we had these first two densities here. And you can tell our Llewellyn site and our Saskatoon site, the number of aphids per plant were already very different from here, but no big difference in yield at the first flowering stage. And then when we got to full flowering, we still had a big difference in the number of aphids represented by these blue ones here, but uh, not a whole lot of yield loss happening yet. Then the yield loss happens after this point of about 300 aphids per plant. So that's one of the numbers that I think we're going to wind up using is 300 aphids per plant is when you're almost looking at total loss happening. So here's our Saskatoon field where we did hit 810 per plant and the yield has dropped, um, but it's not total loss yet. 
So we do see over on the right hand side here, um, we call it the maximum tolerance of aphids, where that's it, your plant has now died. So using the insecticides, I, this is uh, the ones with Lambda cyhalothrin. So the rapid knockdown led to better yields. So the XRL, I called it a slow burn. So it's a bit slower acting and, uh, and led to kind of less yields. And then, yeah, here's our control. So these were untreated plots and basically nothing. These plants are actually wilting from the aphid pressure. And so they suck on the phloem and they will suck a plant dry. Ning made this, this uh, amazing panoramic down here of one of the plots. So this is an untreated plot on the left. And this is a density one treated plot on the right. So the aphid numbers were not high in that plot and they were sprayed early on. So off the combine, we get a heat map that looks like this. And so here are our density one plots and they're this happy blue in terms of yield. And all these plots over here were our density fours in this kind of drab brown color. It just makes you feel sad looking at it. And uh, those were our untreated plots and our density three, four, and five. Some of our density twos are around here with other not quite so happy colors as this blue. So these two plots were side by side. This is a faba bean plot that was sprayed with Lambda Cyhalothrin at density one, nice fat pods right beside it, untreated control, no pods, dead sticks. So there's that, uh, there's that big shot of the panoramic that Ning did. So untreated and treated there, early on treated. So here is, this is the, the Saskatoon field, the aphid population going up here at our Llewellyn site and then our low road site. So you can actually see the increase here. And this is in the untreated plots. So this is number of aphids per plant. So I'm not talking about cumulative aphid days right now, but here's where we hit our first spray. And so it was just as, as it was flowering, our second spray here was right as the pod started. And I wanna draw your attention to this third spray here that was sort of um, at pod filling, but it was only 10 days away from this second spray. So we'll talk about the, the Llewellyn field first in 2019. I'm using 2019 because we had really strong aphid pressure. Like we're looking at uh, about 1300 aphids per plant here. So uh, when the plants start to senesce, that's when the populations start coming down over here. So they get wings and they pick up and they fly away to who knows where. But here's our yield here, those are untreated. You wouldn't be very happy if you had a field that looked like that. And here's that eggs are all treated. So the yields are a little bit lower in our first two densities. And then here's the ones that include the rapid knockdown of the Lambda Cyhalothrin. Here's density one, density two, and then a really stark contrast between density three, four, and five, and those first two densities. So. These ones, this was a difference of 10 days between density two and density one. So we went from a decent crop at these first two densities to a complete wreck by that third density because of that population increase of the P aphids. This is the Saskatoon field. It looks a little bit better. We didn't get the really, really strong pressure, but you can see our density fours here and fives were decreasing compared to those first two spray densities. Dr. West, just so you're aware, we've got a little over three minutes left here. Sounds good. Thanks very much. So 2020, we did the work again, and the pressure was a little bit lower. And if we're looking at number of aphids per plant, here's where we start getting that significant difference. So 250 to 400. So it's in that 300 aphid range per plant. Now, Ning wanted me to point out that we sprayed these plots three times, and we sprayed these plots two times to keep them here. Now this was probably from aphid migration in from untreated plots. So that's an unlikely situation to happen unless you've got teeny tiny plots like we were growing. So from all of this work, <clears throat> we make these linear regressions and we can pull things off of them like the decreasing yield. So this equation over here, and that's a, it's a pretty strong correlation here, the R squared of 0.8. Um, this number down here is actually the the yield that is lost by one aphid. So math is fun sometimes when you can explain it like that. And here is the decrease in yield at, uh, at these fields. So putting that all together, 
our economic injury level have to take into account the cost of insecticide and treatment, the market price, and we use this gain threshold here, and then we develop the EIL. So if we're looking at low insecticide cost and high gain, then we've got a number over here on the side of the, the field that's about 297. This is cumulative aphid days we're looking at right now. And then you can see the vast difference when you've got high insecticide cost and low market price of your, of your fava beans. So uh, it's a really big difference in cumulative aphid days. And here's what it looks like in terms of number of aphids. So about 49 to 260 is that economic injury level. So setting the economic thresholds then, if you are at around 117 aphids per plant, you've got about one day to spray before you hit that economic injury level. So here's your, your real danger zone. If you're at about 48, which was that lowest EIL there, um, you've got about seven days before your aphid population increases to hit that EIL. So these are numbers that we'll be working with probably going forward after Ning's done publishing all of these. And just looking at this, here's our untreated control. And this is how we sampled. You take one plant and bang it down and see how many aphids come off of it. And so we also looked at the top, the middle, and the bottom half of the plant. And on the right, these were treated plants. They were treated 10 days before, and you see almost no aphids on them there. So I'll just skip through these, but it shows you just the, the different fields. And so we had to look at those from the different fields. Here's a beautiful picture of P aphids on lentil. They're actually really hard to see on lentil, so difficult to know if you've got them in your field. So we worked on a few ways to look at that. Thanks very much to our funders. And we've got some contacts down there at the bottom. And I think we're going right into the Q&A. So if you've got any burning questions about aphids or ligus, let's hear them. Thank you, Dr. Wiss, for sharing your research on pulse insects and aphids specifically. As you mentioned, if you do have any questions, please type them into the question box now. Uh, we're going to move into the live Q&A session with the presenter panel. And so I'd ask that all the presenters from this morning who are with us live to please turn on your cameras. And I'm going to hand things off to Sarah Anderson, who is the agronomy manager with SPG. And Sarah, you're welcome to start asking any questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And yeah, thanks again to our panelists for uh, such a great set of diverse presentations. Uh, as uh, as we mentioned, there is a lot of questions that have come through. So let's try and uh, rotate through. Uh, there's a good chance we won't be able to get to them all, um, but hopefully we can follow up with you after. So, sorry, just trying to. Um, so maybe picking up with Dr. Weiss, just uh, since you're last to kind of hold the mic. Um, there was very high levels of ligus that were observed in the northwest area of the province, uh, so citing, you know, greater than 100 per 10 sweeps in canola fields, canola fields in 2021. How are these going to overwinter mm -hmm. and could they be a concern in fields going from canola into pulses in 2022? Oh, that's a great question. So about five or six years ago, I was up in that northwest region and I found about the same number of ligus per sweep in the canola. Then Hector Carcamo said, hey, let's do a project on ligus. And I said, I can get fields, definitely, I can get fields. And then we got the money and the ligus disappeared. So can they move from canola into fava? Certainly they can. That time point where the fava is susceptible, um, where those pods are able to be fed upon, um, happens when you're, when you're knocking down your canola so they can move out into your fava bean if they're nearby. Yeah, so you need to keep an eye on your ligus numbers in all of your crops in the areas. In terms of overwintering, um, the way that winter happened this year is probably really good for the ligus to overwinter. So we had, we had, it basically was winter overnight. We got a big dump of snow and it wasn't cold before that. So this beautiful fall that we had, leading up to you know fall one day winter the next uh, those those ligus bugs are probably not going to have much trouble overwintering because they just tuck in under that blanket of snow and the cold won't bother them perfect um further to that do you have any recommendations for managing ligus and fabas with such a low tolerance level for damage mm. 
Okay, in terms of the tolerance level, we, we actually have no idea how many lagus you need in a field to hit that 1% number on your, on your crop. Actually, by accident, started looking at it um, because I was doing pea aphid work and we, the pea aphids actually cooked this year. So their populations were drastically reduced. They came at the same time, but it got too hot for them. But then I had lagus in my field. So I said, why don't I turn this into a lagus study? And so um, when I was spraying, I was also hitting the lagus bugs. And so I went back to try to look at those, those feeding scars and uh, you know didn't have the opportunity to harvest most of my crops before it snowed. So it was sort of like I did the aphid work and then, okay, let's go back and do the lagus work. And so I don't think Carcamo has been working on numbers like that, but I don't think we have anything firm to just say, yeah, here's how we keep them at threshold. But Okay, fair enough. Um, maybe switching gears back to the, the weed side, uh, Kosha was, was certainly on agronomists and, and growers' minds today. Um, could you just specify the for auxin resistance or synthetic auxin resistance in kosha, what the mechanism is? Is it altered target site or enhanced metabolism or or maybe both? Uh, yeah, so I mean that that's a really good question and one that that we're trying to answer. Uh, the at this point we know or we think that there's multiple mechanisms of of resistance um, to the synthetic auxins in kosha. Um, but as far as what they actually are, um, that, that remains unknown, despite auxin resistance in kosher sort of uh, being present in the States since 1994. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, the auxin pathways, it's complex. Um, so it's, it's a lot harder to, to decipher the mechanism of resistance um, in, in that pathway. Um, but we do know um, in the States that, that, um, it's at least in some populations is partially due to reduced translocation. Um, but as far as populations on the prairies, we, we just unfortunately don't know at this point, but it's something we're looking into. Okay. Are, are you also screening um, root 4 resistant kosha for 2,4-D or is it strictly the Tampa and fluoroxapir? Um, so currently we're, we're just specifically looking at dicamba and fluoroxapir. 2,4-D is kind of a different question. Um, there's, there, there does tend to be some cross resistance for sure. And also some indication that we may have lost 2,4-D a while ago. Um, so the, uh, we haven't, we haven't done a broad screen of 2,4-D, um, resistance in kosha. Um, and we're more specifically focusing on, on dicamba and fluoroxapir, but, um, it's a good question for sure. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, maybe moving into a, a few of the fertility questions. So qu quite a few uh, individuals had questions on, you know, that interaction between uh, ex excessive nitrogen and inoculant. So if the fixation is expected to be minimal due to seeding pulses on high-end soil, is inoculant actually offering any benefits? Uh, can we look at maybe not applying inoculant on lentil or peas on a field with high nitrogen? say, you know, 70 pounds per acre is what's cited in, in a lot of these questions. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a good point. And I can't recall of any research that specifically looked at that inoculant versus no inoculant under high end conditions recently. But I I suspect that really the benefit of that inoculant would the rhizobial inoculant would be very minimal on those soils of high available end. I, I, I mean, and that's looking at high available and in the fall, uh, you know, things could change in some areas in the spring. So you do want to be cognizant that if you did lose a lot of nitrogen because available nitrogen because of, of uh, you know, really wet conditions in the spring, that uh, things may change a little bit. And uh, uh, so for that reason, I, I, I think it's always good to, to do a bit of checking, but yeah, uh, I don't think you're going to see much benefit from an inoculant under those kinds of high available end conditions. Okay. Um, I'm getting into some questions, I guess, uh, in terms of levels. So, is there a level of residual N, you know, that's a problem area where you can see reduced or delayed nodulation, but maybe not enough to make an average yield crop? Yeah, like it seems like, and in that study that we did, 
and then just looking into the general literature that around that that 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre that would be in the soil already plus what you would add as fertilizer once you get up around that level you're going to start to see some reduction and by the time you get above 50 uh you're going to see a significant reduction in the uh, percentage of nitrogen derived from fixation uh you know and i mean the extreme is that 200 that we had there in those pots and there was absolutely no nodules i we didn't do any type of n15 tracer assessment to 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 quantify it but i i would believe there would be no nitrogen fixation at all occurring okay. in those in those 200 treatments i showed you there with the roots fair enough and this is maybe a little bit of a crystal ball follow up to that but is there a cutoff where you just say you know 200 pounds of n economics aside do do we don't plant pulses there or you know is that surely an economic question i mean it, it, it wouldn't be where i would i'd want to be looking at some other crop that's going to be able to benefit from that available nitrogen because it can't fix its own end i mean i think you're really losing out a lot uh and and the other thing i mean there can be some negatives too because you get this sometimes that will promote a really heavy vegetative cover and uh, i've seen pulses growing on high available end soils on fallow is a good example you get this really heavy vegetative growth that tends to fall over lodge uh, in some cases uh, increased disease incidence so uh yeah I, I i think there's better choices than a than, than growing any legume uh, you know some other type oil seed or cereal on that soil with that high available Okay, perfect. Um, maybe a bit of a linking question on that. Uh, are, are those high available and uh, is that doing anything from our weed population maybe specific to kochia or other weeds? Um, yeah, so, so I think certainly um, nutrient availability is one factor that, that governs uh, weed interference, right? So um, it kind of, it depends on the situation for sure, um, but I know um, just as an example, um, talking talking about uh, um, soybean, right? So um, a lot of uh, the work that I did in my PhD, we were looking at, at volunteer canola and soybean, and and that uh, work showed that actually nitrogen and residual nitrogen in in the environment was was basically one of the driving factors for interference from volunteer canola and soybean where basically uh, as we saw nitrogen increase we saw greater yield loss that was imposed by volunteer canola um, so generally in, in pulse mm -hmm. crops i think that that's that's another tool for integrated ma weed management as well right is is specifically targeting those fields that have a bit lower nitrogen right because most weeds um, are, are nitrophilus right it's where they uh, where they do um, prefer higher nitrogen environments, especially in our arable cropping systems, right? So if you're planting um, a legume or a pulse crop on a field with lower residual nitrogen, you can just give that crop a bit of a competitive advantage because it's in part fixing its own nitrogen, whereas the weeds will be nitrogen starved. Um, so I think that it, that certainly does play a role. Perfect. Um, same question, Dr. Wiest. How is how is that uh, background and sort of attracting our ligus or or our aphid crop or aphid insects rather to our crops? That's a really interesting question. So high nitrogen. So if you're an insect and you're feeding on a plant, nitrogen is one of your limiting nutrients. So plants that are pulling in high nitrogen actually attract more insects and uh yeah they do better on plants that that have higher nitrogen so yeah that's the interaction there yeah jeff just a point because uh this year peas that we grew in my 312 class the, the p aphids absolutely ravaged them it's the first time i've ever seen it so i don't know maybe they really <laughs> did like that n200 treatment but wow they were really bad and i think i might have brought them in but i've brought them in in the soil that i brought in to do the to do the study this year well, that's interesting. Are you sure that Sean didn't uh, bring them into your class and put them on there for a joke? <laughs> You've got to split off of my PA fit colony. So it's possible. Um, and so that was the high nitrogen plants then? They were worse than the zero nitrogen plants? I think they were, but it, they got so bad in the end. And unfortunately, looking at the roots, 
and they were also challenged by disease and there i really ha the students really had to struggle to find any nodules on the e on the n0 ones uh, they were small mm. uh they were green or whitish definitely not fixing so uh, uh yeah that stress from those p aphids i think obviously had a negative influence on nitrogen fixation awesome anecdote thanks jeff and good to see you charles hi <laughs> you too jeff good to see you good to see you too <laughs> Um, also on that front, just kind of thinking of, about how insects, yeah, come in and move around. Um, you know, our aphids this year were a little bit lower in some instances. Is that attributed to the heat or are there other things that we can, um, contribute to that? Yeah, I had a beautiful slide, actually. I compared the P aphids in my Saskatoon field from 2021 on the same date to the ones in, uh, 2020. So 2020, we had about 660 aphids in 10 sweeps. We had about nine in 2021. And so I took a look at the the, um, the times that we hit over 30 degrees. And yeah, there were so many days in July, which is that period when the aphids are coming in and their population is starting to build up. And yeah, so our thermal tolerance for most aphid species and P aphids has been looked at twice in Canada and it's like 26 to 30 degrees where they just, you know, they can't hack it. They can't handle it. And so, so is yeah, that heat like killing them or is it 2020? All right. Um, well, when you're under stress like that, you're, you're not dropping six or seven live babies a day and uh, you're probably feeding a whole lot less and you might even just, yeah, keel over and die. So what it was, was definitely a population that did not build up. So they came in at about the same time and they just didn't get going. Okay, perfect. And the actual mechanism could be one of those things. Okay. Or all of them. Um, Dr. Geddes, in the COSHA competition uh, projects that you discussed, you mentioned biomass reduction. Do you also look at the impacts of seed production as a result of these treatments? We do, yeah. So, um, because especially when it comes to kochia, right? Um, basically, kochia populations are are what I would call seed limited, where um, there's it has really short seed longevity in the soil seed bank. So, usually, where the plants went to seed last year is where you're going to have a nice new population this this year, right? So, um, I think that. Uh, so, so we are looking at, at seed production. Um, it just takes a bit longer, right? So, so we don't have those data to show. Uh, but in general, seed production is usually roughly correlated with biomass. Okay. Perfect. Um, I guess we probably have time for one more question. Uh, from a fertility standpoint, we've been chatting about the nitrogen. Uh, I just had a few questions on um, starter phosphorus. So. Uh, if your soil tests are showing that high residual P, do you think it's still necessary going into the 2022 season for some starter phosphorus propulses? Yeah, you know, uh, often, as, as, I, as I indicated, you know, in, in relative rankings of responsiveness of, of crops to P fertilization, usually you don't see as much response of the pulses compared to the oil seeds or the cereals because of that scavenging ability and then if you've got a lot of available phosphorus there to begin with uh, you know uh, I, I don't think you're going to see uh, a really a, 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 a big big response to starter P, particularly under conditions of high available uh, phosphorus unless you're seeding into really cold soils a, a little bit uh, close by the by where the seedling roots are going to be can be benefit, but 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 otherwise uh, I don't think you'd see a a big benefit from it under most conditions where those available uh, P levels are are significantly elevated compared to to what we normally see because they're they're well, pulses generally I have to say in, in the trials that we did some recent ones uh, uh, didn't get a lot of response in in many cases to 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 uh, phosphorus uh, placed in the seed row and this was at fairly low rates and and, and uh, except on soils that were really really deficient. Okay do you think there's any extra need to have that starter if 
say your background levels of N are higher than expected? Are we irritating the problem more by putting seed row math or balancing it out? Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, you don't want to push the, especially under dry conditions, uh, push it by trying to put too much fertilizer in the seed row to begin with. And I always say for starter N, it's better to have it out of the seed row rather than have it in there because it will it will it will move. You know, I mean that being said, you know, uh, you know, situations where the roots are really compromised by disease, um, root diseases, there there can be an additional benefit from that that phosphorus. So um, you know, I say, well, you know, you got lots of available P and that should help that plant access it even though its roots may be compromised. But maybe under those conditions where you really have poor rooting conditions to begin with, you might see a better, a, a, a greater likelihood of, of response to that starter. Perfect, thank you. I, I wish I could keep throwing some questions at, at you guys. I do have some more, <laughs> um, but I think in interest of time, I will hand it back over to Allison and we'll try and round up um, some of those answers uh, to send out to the crew uh, after, after uh, the conclusion of this. So thank you so much for your time and your input. Um, really appreciate that. Thanks, Sarah and Allison for the thank invitation you and for moderating. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, and, and thank you once again, lastly, to all our presenters. And that does wrap up today's workshop. So just sort of as some housekeeping notes here, the recordings from today will be posted on the SPG website and you will receive an email on how to access those. Uh, you'll also receive an email with a link to a survey for you to share your feedback with us. Uh, your opinion does help us deliver valuable extension opportunities and and helps us to find areas to continuously improve. Uh, so for those that, who were in attendance today, if you provided either a CCA or a CCSC number at the time of your registration, you will receive credits for today's sessions. And then lastly, just a note uh, to keep an eye out for some information that it should be hitting your inbox soon about our winter extension meetings. So we will be uh, making stops in the communities of Assiniboia, Melfort, Elroyos, Etonia and Davidson throughout January, February and March. And those meetings will be open to in-person and virtual attendees. So more information uh, and the registration links will be sent out in the coming weeks. Um, that is it for today. That wraps everything up. So just one last thank you and uh, have a great day. Thanks very much. You too. Bye, folks.